This week we go in depth uh, with one of my close friends and a massive producer at the moment, Wongo, where we've introduced him to uh, all, the to all the Together Music producers and they've basically asked a bunch of questions that they felt would help them uh, to grow and get better. I hope you enjoy it. How I got into DJing was just, was actually partying, which is probably like most, most people. Um, but I went over, what was actually, I started producing first. So I went over to a friend's house, Little Fritter, who's also from the Gold Coast. He was um, showing me some tracks that he just put together on his computer and I still didn't quite understand how that's, how dance music was even made. And, um, and I pretty much said, you know, what do I need to do to get started? And he's like, just buy good equipment right from the get-go. He goes, buy, buy a Mac, like an upgraded Mac, buy a keyboard, you know, buy a sound card. So I went out and I, yeah, I think I spent like 5K on my first little setup and, um, and just, just started teaching myself. It was before the times of YouTube, so you sort of had to just fumble your way. <laughs> so I think it took me like a year to finish yeah, my first track. Is this just for retrospect? 06, 07 maybe? Yeah, some, somewhere there. So I think it took me a year to, to actually finish my first track. Was it, was it always like house music? Yeah, it was, it was like minimal techno. It was like probably like Richie Horton stuff bef yeah. beforehand. But I mean, realistically, it, did, it didn't even sound like that. It was pretty much just me putting chord progressions with a beat underneath it with sounds on top. So it wasn't actually like a fully produced, arranged record. It was just sounds that yeah. I thought that was making a song, you know? And um, I guess, yeah, after about a year, I sort of started actually putting other people's tracks into my project and seeing how they arrange it. So you're seeing that, okay, so that, an intro has to be, you know, an equal amount of bars. So I, most of my intros before that were une uh, uneven amounts. So it's just, you know, you just you don't know where it's, you start. It's you something did. that we brought up, I think, earlier. Yeah, 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 just figuring out, like, okay, so why is it, you know, why is there a minute and a half intro on one song and 30 second intro on another song? It's, you know, because different genres need different things, you know, especially with house and techno. Like, I did a track the other day which has a two minute intro and a two minute breakdown. So the actual tr track doesn't even drop till four minutes, but that's, the world that that track lives in is a you know different to what even when I'm DJing I don't usually play tracks like that but I pretty much I just produce how I feel every day so you know over the last you know 10 12 years it's just you know my styles formed itself just from purely just doing what I want to do every single day in the studio and I guess that's sort of how how I got to um, I I open up an empty project file and then I, I find a kick. So usually the kick determines my mood that day. So if it's a really deep thuddy kick, usually I end up writing a techno record or if it's a real toppy sort of kick, maybe it might be a bit more of like a club club banger. Yeah. Um, but my what I usually do is sort of like my prep to opening the project is if I'm driving home or something from work, I'll put on whatever music I feel like listening to. And pretty much when I get to the studio, all those sounds and feelings and stuff in the back of my head so when I actually do start the track I'm not copying anything but I'm sort of inspired from from somewhere. Do you set a certain time for you, for you to Yeah do my, my, my time is seven o'clock in the morning yep. yeah so that's when I feel most inspired I've just had a coffee and it's like before I've read any emails before I've checked my messages it's like my head's completely clear and you know feeling pretty good so I get straight in the studio as early as I possibly can but that works because that's my personality like where if I'm the sort of person who didn't wake up till lunchtime you know and then I knew and then I and then I knew I had from like 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. to do nothing then 3 p.m. would probably be my you know my goal goal now is your studio in your house or do you my, my studio, studio was it has been at my mum's the whole time so I've moved to Sydney and like I had a studio there but um, I lived in Palm Beach and Corumba and stuff like that but now I moved back in with my mum before, well, it was pretty much just to drop, be able to cut my hours down at work. So yeah. I wasn't paying rent. Um, so yeah, my studio is in the spare room of my mum's place. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's been there for, you know, five or six years. Yeah. yeah it's, good. It's, it's good. I think it's good to have somewhere that's not... Your house. Yeah. Not your house. Yeah. Like when I was living in Sydney, I had to ride my bike an hour to get to the studio. And when, by the time I actually got there, it was like... I was fresh as because I'd just ridden, I did some exercise, like I was, yeah. there was no... Had about 300 thoughts on the way there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and like, you're just out of your normal life for a little bit. And then when I used to ride home, it was just, you know, reminiscing about what happened in the studio until you went back the next day. So pretty much my wife worked three jobs when I lived in Sydney just to pay for half of my studio. Because it was like, 
I because I was cause, <laughs> yeah because I was in Sydney to make a career, like to make a name for myself or to make the connections with people in the clubs. So like yeah, she sacrificed quite a lot to just make sure that I had the time to do it, yes. which is really good. She's still sacrificing now. She's still the breadwinner now. So like, <laughs> but you know it's. But, since, you know, since, since, I, since I moved in at my, back at my mum's in November, it, my whole career changed. So it's like I have had time to write the records. I, um, you know, I've had the time to put in t time into my social media and all that sort of stuff. So like all the different little things that I had a manager for, you know, I've physically had time to do it myself. So it's like, you know, my whole, you know, I, I left my management agency. That's purely because I, I, could, I could do it myself. Um, and yeah. And since then, it sort of all came together. And it's also from, I've, I've been managed since, I've been for like 10 years. So, you know, it's taken me a long time to even figure out what, you know, what I, what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. So, you know, pay people that, you know, to do things that I'm not good at, which is like PR and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, just sticking to your strength. Um, I, after what I left- was mind process to go, okay, I'm going to do Well, when I went to Sydney, I think, because Sydney, I moved to Sydney so I could go out to the nightclubs, meet everyone in person. Um, and then my idea of being a producer back then was to just ghost produce for people. So it was like, I didn't really care about my actual personal career as much. It was like, you know, I write weird club records and if something happens, it happens. But um, so I spent a lot of time down there ghost producing, which was more like a nine to five. But it was actually helping me pay, you know, pay my way down there. But it wasn't until I left Sydney and um, all that ghost producing dried up because most of the time they want to sit in the studio with you and stuff like that. And um, so most of it dried up and I had heaps of time to produce for myself. And at that time I was getting a few gigs because I'd made lots of, a lot of connections down Sydney with people. So it's like... I was um, constantly traveling to, to DJ, which made up that extra cash. So I was, um, I guess when I moved to, back to the Gold Coast, after, after when you decide it is your job, I guess that's when it yeah. become, becomes your job, yeah. you know, cause I've like, you know, dropping the hours at work and all that sort of stuff is, you know, you're letting go of a normal secure lifestyle t to be a musician. Do, do you enjoy like ghost producing as much as you do like making your own stuff? If, if it's my genre, like when I write house music, I, I'm always happy. Like I was doing some trap stuff, which, you know, I can't produce trap music as well as trap DJs need their trap music produced because I'm not, I don't, my brain doesn't automatically understand what the next step is. So a lot of the time I was Googling things and YouTubing things or having to ask them lots of questions, which made it harder when they're in the studio as well, because if they don't really know what they're trying to explain and I'm trying to get them to explain it, it's like we never came, I could never get to like a really nice final product. So that stuff, that stuff sucks. But, um, yeah, writing house music and techno, it's just, it's second nature to what I play in nightclubs, to what I listen to in the car and all that sort of stuff. So it's like, that's enjoyable. That's super enjoyable. Depending what I'm trying to make. So usually I try to make all my drums myself. So I do my, do my kick, then my clap, and then I layer my claps or my snares, and then I do my hats. And then if it's, if a track doesn't have enough energy, then I'll put more hats in. If it still doesn't have enough energy, I'll put more hats in. <laughs> and, and if it still doesn't have enough energy, then I'll put a loop that's completely amazing. like you know with the same groove put it under the track and it's like the whole song's finished all of a sudden so it's like i don't know it goes both ways sometimes i'll start with a loop and i'll just find that you know i like those the way those congas work or something and i'll just chop them up and i'll put them into the project S still sounding the way they sounded before but i've got more freedom into um you know putting delays on them and without the other accented percussion inside those loops um, getting in the way and stuff like that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Did you have to change your setup for EDC at all? No, nah, th that was the best bit. For, so e for EDC was even more, he I could do even more what I wanted to. I was playing at 3, <laughs> 3 a.m. My first set was at 3 a.m. So like- it, What time does it start? 7, 7 p.m. Like 7 p.m. till 5 a.m. I think. Oh, yeah. so it's just dark the whole yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty intense. It comes up with like, finishes with the sun coming up. It's, it's too hot. Like the thing is it's like 110 <laughs> degrees there. So it's like nearly 40. Yeah. It's like over 40 degrees Celsius, so it's like hot. And um, so you can't do it during the day. But yeah, so the Cosmos set was at 3 a.m. It was like, I was formatting my set to, to start techno and then move into like more deepish stuff and then finish with techno. So that's pretty much what I did. So that was how my, I structured my set. It was like, okay, I'm after Chris Lorenzo, who's gonna be playing like super UK bass stuff. And um, what's, what's gonna have more energy than that? You know, cause obviously 
I want to impress the crowd first track. So I just played a, a techno record because it's techno records just thumpers. So it's like that was my sort of way of thinking. I've still played some bass stuff. I played some housey stuff, but yeah, it was um you yeah, played whatever I wanted to. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, and then the, the next day, like I did the pool party at one p.m. the next day, and that was like seriously just people in pools and people just laying down on the grass. So I for that set I just played sort of like Eli Brown sort of um, Salado housey sort of stuff. Stuff that I still like listening to but wouldn't typically be a Wongo set. So I do, you know, move to the occasion but, you know, when you've got three of the biggest agents in America like standing side stage, you sort of do the right, do the right thing. <laughs> Not going to play bangers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's heaps of shortcuts. Like, the sh shortcut is one, a major shortcut is splice. Like, if you guys use splice, yeah. that is like, I only discovered it recently, and it's like the best thing that's ever happened to me. Everyone's been talking about it a lot. They're like, it's, it's pumping. Like, well, seriously, yeah, so, so the, point, the point is, like, I was like, saying when you can't finish, when, you, when your track doesn't sound full or doesn't sound finished, and you're like, what is it missing? Then you're like, okay, um, I like the drums in it, so I'm not going to touch the drums. Maybe it just needs like an atmos some atmosphere behind it. Maybe it just needs some thickness. So you'll, I go on a splice, I click what key, key it is and like instantly like I go through 10 things that all fit the track and like and you know and then it's just a matter of finding you know using that and putting it in there and then the biggest thing about me as a producer is processing it's not so much the sounds I'm using or the drums I'm using but it's like the post processing so like once you've st like not steal but when you, when you use a sam sample from someone else's catalog just try and turn it into your own somehow and I just do that through through third-party plugins, if that um, makes sense. Yeah, um, have you, just sort of like moving on to this, um, another part, is have you sort of had any time, like in that 10-year space where you've gone, nah, like I don't think this is gonna happen? Yeah, I mean, every day. <laughs> <laughs> to be completely honest, still every day. I'm an anxious person, and like... How, like how do you help you inside that? How do you help yourself get past? Yeah, I, I mean, there was, there was a, well. last year, so like I got married in the, in November two years ago. And last year, I just genuinely wasn't that excited about music. So it's like, I, it, like you know, I was still producing, I was still trying to write re records, I was still DJing a lot, but like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in the mind frame it, that music wasn't my, my goal at that, for that, you know, for 12 months, which really hurt my career because it was like at a point where I, I needed to start stepping up. And it wasn't till I st just did what I wanted to do, like just, did, write the music that you love, like you're saying, trying to please people. Like I feel like, because I, I didn't have that much time for music, like brain space for it, I was trying to please people in the small amount of time that I had. And it wasn't till I stopped doing that and I just did what I love doing again, that everything, that I, you know, I finished three records in a week and then, you know, I, I got them all signed. They all sounded like me. They all, you know, I was getting my message across through the music. So, I mean, I guess it's just, do it, do it for the right reasons. Like you, you'll fall out of love with music and you'll fall out of love with producing if you're not doing it, not doing what you want to do. You know, if you, if you were writing trap music and, and you actually really like house music now, it doesn't mean you have to keep writing trap music. You know, it probably means you have to start a new alias, you know, as far as getting signed to record labels. But, um, but that's, a, that's like a, another thing that, you know, it's another step you, that's not, you shouldn't stress about that. You should be like, okay, well, if I feel like writing house music today, I'm gonna fucking write house music. Do, do you have um, a particular way like when you hit a wall like where you yeah pr just produce seriously like if i if i'm in a really he weird headspace and i'm like i'm sitting in a studio and i'm like i've been listening to the same loop for for, <laughs> for, for 30 minutes and i'm like i'm just like i just i'm not feeling this what I'll, I'll either i'll either close it and i'll start another thing and then and if, usually then it starts you start run a new loop and you're feeling it and you get somewhere because your brains left whatever mood that was the other one was in or I have a cold shower. So like having a cold shower, seriously, will just reset your way your brain's feeling and you'll go back in there and you'll, and you'll work on it. Um, or going for a walk, going out for coffee for even half an hour, even two hours, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter how long you leave the house for, as long as you, when you get back to the house, you feel fresh. If you try to go back into the studio, bef like when you still feel anxious, it's like, it's not, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah, or, or like I said, th then you still feel anxious, close the project that you're working on, start something new. So I mean, Every single song you produce, you're going to learn something new or you're going to learn new techniques or you're going to, you know, you, I'm still learning every single project. So it's, you're never, nothing's ever wasted. Even if it is a project that you, that you really loved and you got it to like 98% done. If, if, 
if you just can't finish it, then just start the next thing. And then maybe in like, you know, a track that I started in March this year, I I knew that I had this special vocalist that I had in mind for the track. So I sent him the track, he's like, yeah, I'll get some vocals done for it. And then a few months later, he still hadn't sent me anything. So I hit him up two days ago and he's, he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So he sent me vocals within 24 hours. And then, and I start, kept working on that track for March. So it's like, you know, even though it could have been wasted if I never followed up that lead, you know, it's now it's turning into a track that I really want to produce and finish. So yeah, don't ever waste anything. Don't ever delete projects, just, just leave them there. Because another thing that I want to do is, because I have got so many unfinished projects is to like do a st sample pack, you know, make my own sample pack. So <laughs> I've got, you know, 50 projects full of cool sounds that I've pet spent time on liking. And then if I just export them all, put them into package and, and sell it. So it's like, Nothing, yeah, go never. To splice. So, yeah, go to Splice, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then download my own samples. <laughs> oh, man, this is sick. <laughs> Who is this Wongo cat? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if you're ever not feeling it, or if you're ever stuck, just walk out, walk back in when you're feeling right. You know, sometimes I'll start producing at 7 a.m., I'll get to about lunchtime, and I'll be complete. I'll be like, nah, I'm not going back to the studio today. I've, I've done enough work for today. I feel good, you know, and then at 5.30, I'm like, oh, I'm a bit bored, I'm gonna to go to the studio. And then I just go back to the studio. You know, there's no start or end time. It's just whenever I feel good about it. Yeah. I'll give you my very honest feedback on this one. <laughs> um, I think like 60% of it is marketing, or even 70. I think like, I mean, to get to the point where I am now, I think that it's taken, it's 70% who I am and what I am that's, that people are, the reason why people are watching me. Yeah, I, I seriously think like a large part of it is who you are and what you are. Yeah. And until you get to the point where who you are and what you are is like, you know, people, people like you. And then it's like, okay, well, I'm writing heaps of records, but I'm not getting bigger than this. And it's like, okay, why? And it's like, well, you haven't hit a, you haven't made a hit record. So the next job is to write a hit record. So your music can be at the same level as who, who you are and what you are. Um, I think running a record label is 0%. I don't think it's important whatsoever. Um, the reason we started a record label is because no one was signing my records and I felt like I was big enough to to have my records signed. Yeah, see, yeah, so yeah, like I, I, it needed to happen. So starting a record label, I mean, it still took, you know, 16 months or a bit longer to get some traction on the record label, but, um, but that's helped me. Now that the record label is growing at a fast pace, it's also helping my career it's because people know who I am and what I am. Even if I haven't got a track out for six months, they still know that I'm busy. They know that I'm doing things, yeah. So I mean, that I think that's if you're not writing a lot of records, sure, then a record label is a really good thing. Or be, being a manager or being a, a, an agent, you know, being in the music industry, being current. I just want to say a very special thank you to Wongo uh, for coming in and talking to all of our artists and answering a lot of questions and, and obviously giving his thoughts on some of their music. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a like and subscribe and we'll see you next week.